Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Martin Hamilton, and welcome to CGMA Jam Sessions. Today's guest is Adam Swab, a creative director and FX artist at Wolf and Crow. Hey, Adam. Hey, how's it going? Good. Um, so Adam has uh, worked on so many different projects, you know, Tron Legacy, he worked on TV spots, uh, including clients like Nike, and really countless other projects. Um, Adam is also a CGMA instructor, and you're going to be providing some lectures for our upcoming course, Abstract Effects and Houdini, starting soon. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, what should we talk about? Um, well, you know, I, I really want to talk about your CGMA course, but before that, I'd really like to sort of just talk about sort of how you got into making abstract art, um, how you got into that specific role, and really how do you come up with those ideas that you make in Houdini? Um, but just to start off, sort of your schooling, I'm curious, because everyone wants to know schooling, can you do it online? How did you start learning effects? Oh, okay. So I taught myself a lot of stuff um, in Houdini. Uh, it was really tough. So you have to remember that I was starting learning this maybe seven or eight years ago, and there just wasn't the proliferation of learning materials out there at that mm -hmm. time. So at that point, there were a couple really good ones from a website called 3D Buzz. Um, and uh, Peter Clace was actually the main TD that I learned from. And since then, he's gone on to do some really great stuff. Like, I think it was effects lead at Method, and now he's over at the mill. Wow. Um, I don't know if you can get his stuff anymore, but if anybody is fortunate enough to work with him or know him, he's a really amazing, amazing teacher and has a great, um, great way of getting people kind of started in the program. Uh, so I learned uh, basically a little bit through him and that just gave me enough guidance to point me in the right direction and the rest was just learning it on jobs you know get yourself into um we were kind of talking about this before the chat started but uh yeah. getting myself into some trouble situations and yeah. having to stay there all night and figure it out and um there's also some really great forums that are out there uh the side effects forum is really nice there's also another one called odd force um which was probably a little more vibrant i think a few years ago it's um it's still pretty well active and uh and vibrant but it i, I don't quite visit it as much as i used to um but those were really good because those were frequented by very very high level tds um the people who really know what they're doing and you can just ask them direct questions about yeah. stuff and that sorted me out for a lot of things and uh, was great um because i i Apart from my experience working on Tron uh, at Digital Domain, I really just work in smaller studios and have never really been like plugged into a large production environment. So yeah. typically it's been me as the only Houdini user or me and a crew of one or two other people, but not really a room full of TDs that I can just sit there and and ask questions and understand how things are really done in a production mm -hmm. environment. Uh, so yeah, there's been a lot of just, just figuring it out on my own. Um, and I, I'm a person that really likes a challenge too. So a lot of it's puzzles, you know, for me, like how do you solve, you know, this thing that you want to solve? And then you go out and you research and you figure it out. And, you know, to me, that's, that's kind of fun. Um, Cause I started out in motion graphics. Um, so kind of mm -hmm. circling back and talking yeah. about abstraction. Um, my, my education's from Rhode Island school of design. So I have some design background. Um, but while I was there, I really focused on cinematography and filmmaking um, and not so much on digital art or uh, illustration. Uh, I did a little bit of illustration, a little bit of graphic design, but not not too much. It was mostly on storytelling and, and uh, photography and cinematography. Um, but I came out here and I got into motion graphics and that was kind of the start of everything was uh, seeing that there's this other way of dealing with animation and design and things that didn't have to be based in the real world and they didn't have to look like the pristine real world image you could be interpretive about what you were doing and uh yeah i was using cinema 4d for a long time seven oh, yeah yeah i was using that for i don't know seven or eight years mm -hmm. uh eventually got to the point where i felt like what i wanted to do was much more involved than what the program could handle. And it just kind of aligned with side effects releasing Houdini for the Mac, which I was all Mac based at that point. So as soon as they released it for the Mac and they 
they had their free learning edition. I was all in. Um, yeah, and then in, about kind of more abstraction. I, again, most of it just comes from from motion graphics yeah. and trying to tell stories in non-literal ways. And uh, Houdini was so cool because it was this tool where you could do smoke effects and you could do fluids and you could do all this stuff. But you had access to all that raw data that was coming through. And I, I was so intrigued by how you could manipulate that data and things you could do with it that might be a little bit different than what their intention was. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that was part of, I think, my early my early stuff was like, how can I take this and exploit it and do things that are different than what's happening in a traditional effects pipeline? Yeah, and I, I hear that sort of a lot about people moving from motion graphics to Houdini and effects. And I think sort of it really fits in for you, whereas motion graphics really is this sort of abstract expression of movement and then sort of fits right into what um, you do now in Houdini. Yeah, I, I missed that last part. It fits into balance. Say that again. Sort of what you do in Houdini now, where Houdini now, it's sort of, you really get to explore that even further, that idea of using motion to sort of express ideas. Yeah, I mean... I think it all comes from your your brain and the software is just a tool um, mm -hmm. and it, it's just about what tool feels right for you and people always you know I get a lot of people asking me like should I because they know I, I come from a cinema 4d background as well and they yeah. ask me like should I learn cinema should I learn Houdini and I, my response is always try out both of the programs because they're just tools and see what feels right to you and yeah. what you're happy working with and what you're comfortable working with um, I'm, I'm really like in ju in general in life, I'm kind of tool agnostic, um, and I always feel like just do the pick the right tool for the job, and don't just pick the tool because that's the tool. And I'm I'm kind of not really in favor of the the like you know computer program fanboys and stuff like that because um, yeah. it just it just gets too tribal, and you end up in your own box, and you never actually see what's happening elsewhere. Um, you know, so like yeah. I would, I would entertain Blender, I would entertain my, I would entertain Max, and I, I use Max before as well. I would entertain Cinema 4D again if it ended up doing some of the things that I wanted it to do. But uh, yeah, Houdini is the program that basically works the way I want it to work, and it's like my brain works in that very logical way. The the node yeah. structure is totally, totally the way I think, and I can just look at it and understand the flow and understand how things are happening. Um, mm -hmm. And the proceduralism is amazing, amazing. I, uh, you know, obviously used to doing poly models and stuff like that and just be able to say, you know what, I don't have to bake any of this stuff in. I can go back and just make a procedure uh, and then adjust the procedures to make new variations of what I'm doing is, again, you want to talk about abstraction, emotion, design, and all that other stuff. It's there. There's something really pure about just making making code or making a system and gu guiding the system and letting the system fill in a lot of the gaps and create a lot of the artwork for you. Um, and I think that's really beautiful. Yeah. And you really got me thinking too right there how you're you're sort of a, you know, a creative director as well as an effects artist. And you're talking a lot about, you know, nodes and very technical things. And I was curious, where do you see sort of that line between your creative side, the creative director, and the more technical effects side? Well, I have to do both. Um, they're both fun, and they both offer many different challenges. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm generally placed in a position where I'm taking over the creative ownership of my jobs. Um, but then because a lot of my jobs are not actually very big budget, um, or the ideas that I have in my head are so hard to actually explain or to get another artist to do that I end up doing a lot of it myself as well um, for both of those reasons. So I, I, I take a lot of, I would say, pretty big ownership over the work that I'm doing. Um, and that feels great. It, it's quite stressful, though, because you can't just separate the two responsibilities as much as you would. Um, I would say that... Uh, Probably the more fun part, even though I th I thought that the the, uh, the creative stuff would be more fun, but I actually really enjoy the technical stuff. Okay. Um, I, there's something just very pure about answers that have right 
I mean, questions that have right and wrong answers. Uh, yeah. And that's what, the, that's what the technical stuff gives you. But the creative stuff, there's the answer that's in your head. And then there's what the client wants. And you always feel like there's some expe- expectation that you have to make them happy. Um, and there's always a little bit of guesswork about what's in their head. So you never quite feel, or at least I never feel quite 100% confident just saying, this is it, this is the way it's going to be, because the client will always be like, yeah, I don't think so. That's not what we want. <laughs> Redo it. Um, yeah. And you don't you don't want to get in that situation. You want to, you never want the client to be like, we hate this, redo it. So uh, that yeah. happens a lot. I'm sure people know that. Oh, my. <laughs> that doesn't sound too good having to deal with that. Um, I think it's, it's cool how you said that you really start to enjoy the, the technical side. Because like you said, I'm, I'm sort of with you. I really liked math back in high school. Having questions that have answers is just really sort of, there's something satisfying about it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, people can argue with you about a technique that you've used, but they can't argue about whether the answer is right or wrong there, you know? Honestly. I need I need to go from A to B. It has to take 12 frames and it needs to look like that. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Make that happen. Yeah. And then sort of, I wanted to explore more about your, your thought process about when creating effects. And so the technical side is really important, obviously. But then for when you start creating an effect, especially abstract ones, do you like to gather real world references? And if you yeah. do sort of, how do you get real world references for things that are going to be abstract? Um, I mean, it depends on what your design is, but when I say, when you say real world, for me, real world doesn't actually mean like something that exists in the physical world, but there's mm-hmm. references to other artists work and other designers work and things yeah. that ha- they convey the mood or they convey, convey the, the textures or the tonalities that you're looking for. Um, and you'll see that almost, I mean, I can't think of a single designer that I've ever worked with that doesn't gather reference and keep these uh, Pinterest boards and mood boards and and have yeah. a folder full of inspiration for the projects that they're working on. Uh, nobody designs in the box. Um, and I mean, the thing is a lot of people have solved problems before you design problems, design challenges and artistic challenges. And there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with seeing what they've done that works and maybe what's not working or where you want to go um, with your stuff that's a little bit different. But yeah, every every good artist, I think, is uh, looking at reference constantly. Um, but yeah, for me, where do I go to get that stuff? It'd be like Vimeo and Pinterest and um, uh, Stash Media has a pretty good feed for their stuff for mm-hmm. new and interesting work. Um, I have a network of effects artists, and I'm always looking at little R and D tests that people do. Like I love looking at R and D, yeah, uh, really raw stuff. Um, because it might not be applicable for what they're doing, but sometimes you can see a little spark of an idea there, you know, where you can say, oh, that's a like that's an interesting thing to do with a grain solver or a sand solver that doesn't actually look like sand. Um, so yeah. there's there's a lot of really interesting R and D that you can find just by following other effects artists as well. Yeah, and I agree with you too about sort of looking to others for inspiration and just let you know like the the sort of tests that you do, I was sort of checking out yours on uh, your Vimeo or mm-hmm. your Celeste project. And they're just so cool and just the way they look and, and form. And I really sort of agree with looking towards both nature and then other artists who you look up to, sort of seeing how they do it. How do they make things look the way they look? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, every artist is going to bring their own point of view to what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, there's something that I really want things to feel realistic and and natural, um, but also have a, a a meaning to the way that they move or the way that they work or the way that they look. Uh, it's not often that I'm designing stuff that's meant to just look cool for the sake of looking cool. Uh, it's always to serve a larger purpose, um, you know, and that, that can be a bit tougher, I think. Um, because you're always trying to Im- imbue a little or imbibe a little bit more stuff, uh, put a little bit more meaning into what's happening. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's definitely tricky. I will def- definitely say that. Yeah, and I think what you said about having a reason behind something and not just it being cool is really useful, especially in abstract effects. Because I think sometimes people can get really lost 
and like just these crazy looking things. And if you have a reason behind it, though, you can always sort of come back to that reason, sort of ground your facts. Yeah, that's that's part of like the design school philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. At least the RISD thing is that form follows function. So yeah. that, that's, I mean, there, there's definitely definitely plenty of people that will make a function follow the form. They'll just make the form and then they'll fit it into the function. But yeah, for mm -hmm. for what we do, it's it's a lot of it is like what is the the function first what is its purpose and then you design around that purpose yeah and i really like artists that do that and i think when you do that it helps the the audience see sort of that reasoning behind it and it makes them it's easier to follow what's going on with the effects um, i'm talking a little bit more about your references and stuff like that i'm always curious about artists do you have anything specifically you like to look to expand what i like to call a visual library like certain things you look at, nature, um, like Blue Planet 2, you know, things like that, just areas you like to look to for inspiration? Um, I, I, honestly, my Pinterest board is probably the place that I look to most, and a lot of it mm -hmm. is, is uh, sculptural, realistic stuff, mm -hmm. things that you could actually physically touch that are art gallery pieces, things in art museums. Um, I have some things that are, that are digital, but Honestly, like my digital board is is pretty small. Um, it's mostly like real world things, and a lot of it's like architecture, um, and sculpture, and uh, gallery installations. Uh, I just wow. there's just something really tactile about that. Like there, there's pieces that I I did. There was a piece with uh, some melting ladies in it, and that, that was, was inspired. Cool. Oh, thank you. That that was inspired by an artist named Urs Fisher who does these amazing, immense um, wax sculptures. And they're actually candles. And when I say immense, I mean, they're like 20 feet tall. Wow. Uh, there, there was one in in the get this gallery at uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Los Angeles. And it was the centerpiece. He had, um, it was a gigantic room full of, I don't know, 200 of these smaller smaller wax sculptures and then in the center of this was this gigantic one which was 20 feet or something like that and when the show opened it's a candle on the inside when the show opened he had lit the top of this candle and we showed up uh we being my wife and myself showed up to this gallery show maybe like a week into it and by then the uh the wax sculpture had melted about a third of the way through and like the whole idea is like it's this temporary piece of art um and it's transitional and it's reformative the whole way that it's it's working and that inspired this this other thing it was a major reference uh for what i was doing and i'll, I'll repeat the name the guy's name is urs u-r-s fisher um and if you're not familiar with his stuff you should check it out because it's it's just mind-blowingly good yeah i'm just uh -huh. gonna check that it sounds so cool and i can't believe that it lasted for like almost an, like more than a week Oh yeah, I mean it's it's gigantic and, and burning at not too high of a temperature. Um, but uh, yeah, so amazing. And then you've got um, oh, I'm blanking on the name. There was a very famous artist here who just paints with with light, um, and he had done a another like retrospective at Mocha down downtown here. And you'd go into his rooms, and they were just 100% just pure light, like the most pure light you've ever seen uh it was like the craziest thing ever but that if you ever want to get a sense of what color is like um this is the artist to do and what's his name again I, you know i'm blanking on the name um okay. i'm gonna take light light sculptures yeah i'm typing a little bit here to see if i can figure out who that was that's, I love how you sort of get your influences from like these other really contemporary artists around you too, and how like you really draw inspiration from these people who just do these really abstract things, and then you sort of bring it into the the digital, like how you do with that um, the melting ladies, which is really cool. Yeah, and I, I think that there's like just in general, there's there's too much um, repetition. I think that happens in the field here especially what i've seen like i look at a lot of reels and a lot of the time mm -hmm. you're, you're not seeing things that look new they just look like recycled versions of the same work and they're all just variations of the same thing and you don't see 
a lot of people really pushing new ground. And I think what's going on is it's a lot of just like cannibalization of people looking at all the same things and looking at the same people and just reiterating the same stuff uh, rather than looking at different places and trying to gain unique perspectives. Um, and that's advice that I'll give to any student is honestly, stop looking at digital work. If you're a CG artist, stop looking at CG. Just go out yeah. and find, find other things that are outside of your field to look at and to be inspired by. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. And I think you said in a lot of different fields of, of digital art where people, there's just a lot of repetition of what's popular. Um, and it's really important to sort of step out of that boundary and sort of expand just what's already there. Yeah. So that's really, so you said you look at reels a lot, correct? Yeah, I mean, I've seen, I don't know how many reels I've seen at this point, a thousand reels, yeah. I have no idea, a lot, a lot of reels. Yeah, and it, it sounds like you really sort of like what's unique um, in people's reels. And I was wondering, do you have any particular effects that you like to see the most of vision? Like you see an effect and you're like, that's really well done or that's something really unique? No, um, it depends. Like if if there's a job that requires a specific effect, like I need somebody to come in and make an explosion, then obviously yeah. I'm going to look at the reel and see if they have something that looks like an explosion and looks like they've done a decent job on it. Mm -hmm. um, but what I look for most is, is thinking and uh, design sensibilities because mm -hmm. the work that I'm doing and that we're doing at Wolf and Crow is more design based than it is about come here and make a building blow up. So um, I'm looking more for people that don't require you to solve every step of the problem for them, that you can give them kind of a general idea of what you want and, and you know, what the aesthetic sensibility should be. And hopefully they can take it from there and push stuff. I mean, I want people, at least when I'm creative directing a project, I want people who are going to do a better job than me and are going to make stuff better. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm like a huge proponent of hiring people that are better than me. Um, you know, it's always tough to find and, you know, sometimes you can't afford those people. But uh, I find that when you're staffed like that and every person on the job, like if you if I have a compositor on the job and the compositor is better than me, fantastic. I'm so happy. <laughs> I don't feel competitive. I don't want to compete with with the people that are working for me. All I want to do is is guide the process and bring it to completion and help push the vision along and, and keep the team moving forward. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that artist name, by the way, was James Terrell. And we, we can think, yeah, James Terrell. And we can thank my wife for that, by the way. She's awesome with her research skills. That's great. Thank you. Uh, how do you spell that? J-A-M-E-S? And then tell the last one. Let me, I'll type it right into the field here, into the chat field. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, if you guys have a chance to see this guy's work in real life, do it. Absolutely go and see this guy's work. It is 100% worth it. Um, a picture is not going to do this justice. It. I, I don't know how else to say this. It's like the most pure way of experience color that you will ever have in your entire lives. Wow. Yeah, definitely going to check that out. I'll, I'll yeah. Take your, I'll take your word for it, for sure. Yeah. Well, and, hopefully. Hopefully he, he does some uh, some stuff in Hawaii. Oh, that would be so sweet. I'd love to go to visit that. Um, to throw it back to what you were just, just saying, though. Yeah, just, just on a, a slightly off-topic thing, the last mm -hmm. thing I read about James Terrell is they were doing um, so off-topic, and, and uh, excuse me if this goes into, if this oh, is no too problem. blue, but they were doing um, uh, art exhibits. This was, I think, in Australia, art exhibits in the nude. And it, you had to show up after hours and everybody had to be 100% naked. And I remember, I think they were going to the James Terrell exhibits around then and just bathing in the light and stuff. It was just kind of crazy. That's so crazy. Like really cool at the same time, right? Yeah, yeah. I love that sort of abstract, really out there type of art. But sorry. Um, I like that. I like that you brought that up. Though. I always love hearing about new artists that I can go look up. Um, but what you're saying about earlier, I, I hear you talking about something that I hear a lot of effects artists talk about, and that's sort of problem solving a 
on the job, being able to figure out a problem and sort of come to a conclusion about how do I figure this out. Um, I just wanted to sort of get your thoughts on how important is problem solving if you want to be an effects artist? Well, I think it's important to be able to solve problems if you're part of a production pipeline, period. Uh, if nice. you want to be like, let me just like make that a larger conversation. If you want to be a useful employee at any organization, you should solve problems. You should not be going to people with your problems and expecting them to solve them for you, right? Yeah. Like, it, it I, it's ridiculous that, and I've I have this happen so many times on the job that you have a junior who will ask you a question and ha want you to spend an hour solving a problem for them that they could have looked up on Google and spent that mm -hmm. hour solving themselves. Um, in just like in general advice, like you always want to go to uh, a supervisor, an employer, whomever. You don't want to just bring problems to them. You want to bring solutions to them. And, you know, you can identify the problems, but hopefully you've done a little bit and, you know, research a little bit or at least go and have some idea about how you want to tackle the problem. And you can say, is this the right way to do it? As opposed to, I don't know what, I don't know what to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Problem solving is really important. And I find that it's a skill that too many people don't have. Um, I don't, I don't really know why that is, but um, yeah, it's very, it's very strange. Yeah. And I like how you said sort of pretty much any production or any business group, if you want to be a problem solver. <clears throat> and I was wondering, Speaking more about effects and students who are coming up and want to be effects artists, what do you think they should really try and put effort into learning what to do so then when they get on the job, they're not too lost? Like if you only had one hour a day to study effects and expand your knowledge, what would you think you should be looking for? Hmm. Well, it's, it's tough because it's tough for me to answer that because I'm not working at like a feature film effects place. Yeah. And, yeah. And, so the advice that I give here is, is going to be coming from my own, you know, branch that I work in. Okay. Um, but I would say in general, though, most people don't care about looking or don't want to see half finished work. They don't want to see your half finished ideas. And I think it says a lot about students to bring in something that looks finished and complete. And which means like no play blasts and flip books and stuff like that. If you want to have a section of your reel that shows that stuff, that's great. But you actually need to go through the time and the process of rendering it and copying it and making it look good and putting it together and showing that you can bring stuff to the finish line. Um, otherwise, you know, what can we judge you on as, as an employer? What can we judge you on other than you bring us half finished work? And what are we supposed to do? Finish it for you, right? So proving that yeah. you have something you know, that you can actually bring stuff to completion, I think is a really big part of the process. A lot of stuff can be taught on jobs, or I know that if you go into like the big feature places, they, like as a junior artist, you're not gonna be creating tools from scratch. You're gonna be using a lot of other people's setups and you're just going to be spending your time iterating that work. And it doesn't take somebody with like an amazing reel to do that um, because, you're honestly not dealing with unlocking the tools too much. You're just, you know, dealing with the software and what they're going to care about is, do you know the software? Do you know your way around it? Yeah. If a problem comes up, do you, can this person identify it? They really are going to want to know, like, does this person have the aesthetics that they're going to get this thing in 10, inter 10 iterations versus 200 iterations, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's the other thing is like knowing that you're going to get something in a reasonable amount of time. And the only way you can judge that is by seeing the level of completion, I think, on somebody's work. Other than that, like, if you want to be a fluid specialist, show a lot of fluid work. If you want to be a rigid body guy or girl, show a lot of rigid body work, you know. Um, my, my stuff, again, is more like design-based. I'd rather see somebody that had good thinking, even if the, even if you, you didn't have the level of finish that it needed to have, at least if you're thinking well, and it shows like good keyframes, uh, good sense of motion, good sense of style, good aesthetic sensibilities, you know, mm -hmm. that'll get you much further than somebody who can show me the world's best smoke simulation. Mm -hmm. And so I like to bring up that being polished, because I think that really does show a lot about what this student's about. If you throw up something that's not really polished, 
you know, isn't edited as well as it could have been, it sort of shows a little bit about who that student is. Like, it seems like it might be someone that just doesn't want to go 110%. And so you really do think that polish is, is where it's at. You have to be to the, not necessarily to the T, but really be showing that you're putting in the effort. Yeah, and I think the other thing too is when whenever you're watching reels, you don't want a disclaimer with a reel, meaning like you don't want somebody sending a reel and saying, "Well, I didn't get to do this because I'm a student and I ran out yeah. of time or yeah. I ran out of resources or whatever it is." Because in a production environment, you don't have the excuses. Like no one's going going to accept that. So, yeah, I think just getting the work to the finish line is is super important. Yeah. Um... Definitely, and I think students really sort of have to go the extra mile. The people that sort of make excuses, well, if you're working with them, it sort of just sets you up for thinking, are these people just going to be making excuses on the job as well? And we all have excuses, but sometimes power through, get to the finish line, right? Yeah, and I think any, everybody remembers, everybody who's who's gone to school and done this stuff remembers um, how ill-prepared they were for their job <laughs> when they first started. Um because you you don't realize how luxurious it is when you're at school. You think you're, and you are. I'm not I'm not discounting you know how much work goes into yeah. being in college because it was a crazy amount of work. But at the same time, you're doing a project and somebody's giving you a half a year to make a three minute film or something like that, mm -hmm. and you're not going to get that. You're just not going to get that in the real world. Nobody's going to just give you that luxury of time with nothing else to do. Um, mm -hmm. and no check-ins and all that other stuff. You're going to have to be, you know, checking in. And if you're not making the mark every couple weeks, then yeah, you could be let go. Uh, so the stress level is a lot higher and the accountability is a lot higher than when people are at school. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a good point about, about students. And since we're getting close to the topic about teaching, learning, um, and talking about your class, um, I want to start talking about it soon, but right before that, I'd like to ask you, because you're a creative director, a teacher, you sort of see a lot of people come through the process. I was wondering if you see any traits um, of your most successful students or people that you work with, and what did you learn from other students that more people should be taking note of? What should people do to become sort of the best student to put in the most amount of work, to sort of get the most mileage out of a class? Uh, well, for students, completing the homework, 100%. Mm -hmm. um, because I have 20 students, or have, for each of these sessions, I've had 20 students per session, and only about six or seven routinely do the homework. And maybe by the end of week eight, you've got about five or six that have done it every single week. And yeah. I can 100% tell you that if you're not doing your homework, then you're not going to get the value of the class uh, because mm -hmm. you're not going, you're not going to get the interaction with me. Other than asking me random questions here and there, you're not going to get the feedback. You're not going to get me as invested in what you're doing. Um, it, it's just like because you're you're just not participating, and that's the, how we participate here is by asking questions, turning in homework, getting feedback. Um, yeah. So that like just as a student of the class, I would say really try to block out time every week. I would I would block out a solid eight to twelve hour chunk of your yeah. day to do the homework, not just to watch the class and the instruction material, but to actually do the homework and do the assignments and to really try to turn in homework every single week so that you get the benefit of the instruction. Um, Cause anybody can watch tutorials, right? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of like, like people that work for me and who have um, been the mm -hmm. most successful, uh, I think it's people that really want to um, want to offer something creative there that don't just come in looking to push buttons. Because um, there there are plenty of people that come in and say, "Look, I'm just here to operate the program and just tell me what you need done." And and you know, if you want an explosion, you know, this big and this big, I'll do it. But it, the people that really want to come in and and put their stamp on it and and own take some ownership over what they're doing, uh, you. Uh, nothing really makes, excuse me, nothing really takes the place of a great attitude. Um, and a great attitude and enthusiasm for the work and enthusiasm for the process and for collaboration as well. Mm -hmm. I think goes a really, really long way. Um, of course, this all, you know, is predicated on you having at least some of the chops that you need to get your foot in the door. 
But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah the people that we will 100% reach out to consistently are the people that are just a pleasure to work with. Yeah, and I, I hear that a lot from everyone in all sides of the industry. It's really the, uh, of course, obviously you need the, the skills to get in, but then also just being a nice person to work with, so you're easy to talk to, willing to work with other people. You know, it's not just your way or the highway. You want to work with everyone and sort of figure out how can we work together. Yeah, and I think, I mean, because we're dealing in commercials, um, mm -hmm. which is very topsy-turvy, uh, I'm sure film is quite a bit as well, but, you know, we're on tight deadlines, and we get clients a lot of times that don't know what they want until they've seen 10 versions of the thing they don't want. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, with the clock running down, um, that is, a, that's a tough place to be in, and and it can be really tough to ask your your juniors and your other collaborators in the process to roll with those punches because it's um it's really it is demoralizing to productions to go through that stuff and you know to really find people that are are not going to take it personally when the client changes direction and that shot they've been working on for three weeks is now killed and we have to do something else entirely um you know that's that's just professionalism there and you know i will personally tell you that's tough to that's just tough to deal with um yeah just for myself, like, you know, you get a demoralizing phone call with your client and uh, you've got to go and put on the happy face and, and try to get the team working again and oh, yeah. keep everybody motivated. Um, but to have people that are part of the process that, that can understand that, you know, none of this is personal. <laughs> it's, it's a commercial field yeah. and, and we're at the mercy of clients and to make work as good as we possibly can. And hopefully the clients allow us to get there and in the best cases, collaborate with us and we get there together. Yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it and sort of laying out for new students what the environment is for when you work in the actual industry. Um, and so this offers this little segue into talking about your class, Abstract Effects in Houdini. Um, and so in general, what can students really expect to learn from your class? Okay, so what they can expect to learn. Number one, let's assume that, and I do assume, that students are coming in with Houdini knowledge already, mm -hmm. right? You have understanding of the program, you have rendered something, hopefully, in the program, and you're aware of the different contexts and the functions and how to manipulate the viewport and how to place objects in the scene. And, and you basically have had, you know, maybe two to three months of experience of just playing around and getting your feet wet with the program. So we go from there and we start building up some of the mechanisms of proceduralism and understanding how we can start to um, start to harness the power of Houdini. And all of this is geared towards abstraction and a high uh, importance is placed on looking at nature and looking at duplicating some of the things that we see in nature. Um, mm -hmm. so we do, we start with a breakdown of the class and I'm going to have to really quickly look up the, um, the actual course description so that I can. Yeah, no problem. And then for anyone wondering about the course too, I'll just link it in the, in the chat right now. Uh, after right there, it's in the chat if you want to check on it too, Adam. Yeah. So let me, let me just make sure that I'm hundred percent right. When I look at the course description, just to go week by week and tell you exactly how it's working here. Yeah. Um, nice. Yeah. So at first we, we kind of go through a lot of the modeling tools and a lot of the kind of the base layer of what you would need for, for working in Houdini. And none of the stuff that we're going to do is going to be simulated except for, I think one of the chapters we get into simulations. But first it's like, how do we do models and how do we build stuff? And what does it mean to do this procedurally as opposed to box modeling and poly modeling and some of the various forms of modeling that people might be used to? And the homework for that class is really interesting because we look at the Ernst Haeckel uh, diagrams and illustrations that he's done and we do homework that is basically do a procedural recreation or inspired organism based on these Haeckel diagrams. Um, and I, to me, that's like an amazing first assignment because you have a reference point and you have some tools to work with and you can actually go and start making stuff. And then we get into a lot of some of the more, um, I, I call all these kind of like building blocks, right? Into building blocks of 
dealing with abstraction and trying to break it down into a systematic way. So we start looking at noises and randomness and how these things can work together and balance each other out to create harmony. Mm -hmm. uh, we then ta start talking about duplication and repetition, and we're working with some of the copy operators in Houdini to understand how we can manipulate data to control our copies uh, and create you know, really interesting, beautiful design without uh, too much work. Um, volumes, and the next thing we get into in volumes are a huge, huge way of working because you can actually sculpt like physical 3D space uh, using mathematics and noises and stuff like that. Yeah. Things that are, are much hard, like would be impossible for you to actually hand sculpt. Uh, so we look into doing some of that kind of stuff. Then we start getting the last half of the class gets a bit more technical. And we start looking at things like point clouds and point cloud data and how we can manipulate these things and getting our feet wet, just writing code so that we can do a little bit of VEX coding later on. Mm -hmm. uh, we get into fractals finally, and recurse, not finally, we still have a couple more things to do to go, but we get into fractals and recursive forms and branching structures. So we're looking at L systems and we do a fractal flame algorithm, uh, our own little implementation of the fractal flame algorithm in Houdini, um, which is all written in code. So by week six, we're, we're actually doing like a full chapter just in code. Um, and hopefully none of it's too scary, but yeah, the idea is to ramp up into that because I do consider that necessary. And then the week seven is, uh, that one, it was more of like an up for grabs one. The idea was to do um, evolving systems, growth algorithms. And we ended up doing some stuff uh, that was like cellular division, all done in solvers uh, okay. using volumes of getting some really cool results. And then finally, we look into lighting and rendering um, this one is more of a, like, let me help you kick out a render as opposed to, we're going to talk about everything that makes a beautiful render and, um, go into all the, you know, the qualities that make a material, a material. I, I wish I could have done that, but that's like an eight hour class in itself. Um, yeah. but at least the, like, let's get you going and get renders out. Uh, a lot of people aren't familiar with Mantra and they aren't familiar with some of the higher level things that you can do in Mantra that you can't do in other renderers. So we do a lot of um, render time stuff as well. So showing how to generate uh, point clouds at render time and showing how to generate volume displacement at render time or just write volumes straight into the Mantra render without generating them in your Houdini file. Just kind of like weird, interesting things that you can kind of experiment with and and uh, much higher level stuff than you'll see out there in other tutorials. Yeah, it sounds like your class, you're really starting to push all those limits. I think that's what's great about the abstract is that you get to explore all these different areas of Houdini, which I've never heard of before, which are really just sort of unique and can create your own unique ideas from it. Yeah. Did do we have um I don't know if you were able to to get any of the homework assignments posted here for other people to check out, but I, I have to tell you that the homework that's come through uh this second class has been amazing. And we had some really great ones in the first class as well, but uh uh definitely the first four or five weeks of the second class has just been phenomenal. So um again, that's a that is the students. I, I got very lucky and had some great students. Um you know, not saying that I'm not like the world's best teacher, of course, <laughs> amazing. But uh, yeah. no, the students, the students were super motivated and, and did a great job. Um, so there's a, the class is as much about what you want to put into it and what you want to get out of it as it is about mm -hmm. learning the stuff. Um, and I tried to make it very much like an art school version of a class rather than a technical version of a class, at least the way that I, that I run it, where I don't want people coming out with the same homework meaning like everybody has they just follow what i'm doing and yeah, they come out i with... think that's that's really good for you to do that because that is a big part of uh, how some people come out of classes and it's all the same but that's really good that you're focusing on everyone doing their individual thing but through sort of the same processes which is what's great about abstract randomization yeah yeah, I think it's I think it's important. That's one thing that's always bothered me about tutorials um, is that a lot of times you come out with a replica of what the instructor's done, but it's not it's not enough to really take you into your own direction or to know how to get further than what this person has done in the tutorial. So I I really do try to get 
students to to put their own spin on things and take the assignments in their own directions. And, and for that, um, with the exception of the first class, everything is very, very open in terms of where you can go with the homework. And just the variety that you get back from the students has been amazing. Um, I think that's that's great that you're doing that and having each student sort of do their own thing. And then we talked a little bit about what students can do to get the most out of their class. And I was curious if students really want to strive to be like the top percent what can they do to really elevate their art and sort of go beyond? Uh, I think um, number one is getting renders out for every for every class. Um, that can be tough to do. Uh, um, a lot of people aren't familiar with rendering in Houdini, or they don't they have like an indie license, and they're not familiar with you know some of the shaders, or they're more familiar with Cinema 4D, and they just mm -hmm. they're not sure how to export the data in a way that that they can render it. Um, so that can be challenging, but obviously it's about presentation in terms of like having something to show, you know, having something that's that's presentable and worthy of like an Instagram post or something like that every week, I think is amazing. Yeah. Um, animations and renders and stuff are, are great as well. Um, you know, the, the, the farthest you can take your homework, uh, the further you can take your homework, the better it's going to be. I think mm -hmm. just in terms of like what you can show at the end of the class, you don't want to show just a bunch of like, gray flip books and stuff um and you know people are busy i understand that i'd, I'd never ever have beat up a student for turning in a flip book or for turning in something that looked um incomplete i would never i would never do that um because i do understand that there, there are real world challenges and people are trying to do what they can in the class i think as long as people turn stuff in i'm i'm always very happy yeah and that's really great to hear sort of how you know, students <clears throat> push themselves, but then also you're still a very understanding teacher um, when it comes to sort of homework and stuff like that. You, you realize life is a thing, which I think is, is great to have in a, a teacher. Yeah, I don't I don't know what Alex is, is going to, what his philosophy is, but my, my philosophy was... Um never beat the students up <laughs> like i'm i'm um I, I mean i will give you honest critiques um i'm not i'm not here to sugarcoat stuff and i'm not yeah. here to tell you you've done an amazing job if you haven't really done an amazing job but i'm also not here to beat you up and make you feel bad about what you were able to con contribute to class um mm -hmm. because above all like i view this as something that should be fun right it's going to be hard work but it better be fun if you're going to do it. And as a teacher to be somebody that's going to just make you feel shamed every week or something like that. I mean, that seems, that seems silly to me. Um, yeah. you know, yeah. it, we're, we're not curing cancer here. We're just making art and you know, that should be fun and it should be experimental and you should look forward to what you're doing every week. That's kind of my general philosophy, at least with how I, I go about the class and I go about instructing the students. Mm -hmm. and I think that's a really good philosophy because it's it's a nice balance between honest critique, but then also being able to sort of inspire students to to keep going. Um, and then so I think we're near a bit of the end of the webinar. So um, if anyone has questions, start thinking it up. And uh, once again, check out Adam's course, uh, Abstract Effects in Houdini, and it's going to be starting July twenty first, correct? Uh, I don't know um, because, <laughs> it is, because, it I, because I won't I won't be back until the uh, I'm taking this this session off so it's going to be Alex uh, Lombardi I think teaching or taking over he'll be doing my material but he's going to be doing the Q and A's and stuff like that um, yeah and then but, for uh, anyone sort of wondering what that what that means so Alex Lombardi um, all the lectures are provided by Adam here but then Alex Lombardi is going to be sort of the instructor sort of helping people out when they need help. Um, Alex is a great artist who, of course, works at uh, Stormborn, and he's done really great stuff. You can check him out online. Um, he's a great, great artist. Yeah, and I'm sure Alex is going to bring his own perspective as well into the material mm -hmm. and into the Q and A's. So uh, it, it's going to be a different class, but I'm sure it'll be amazing as well. Yeah. Um, so everyone, I just I posted the the link in the chat again in case you want to check out that. Check out uh, the abstract effects in the beginning. And then now, Adam, are you open for some Q and A from yeah, yeah, of course, the, the yeah. So anyone, if you have any questions, just pop in the chat, um, and we'll get to it.
Oh, and if you uh, posted a question before, um, could you please post it again? There's a lot in the chat right now. Uh, so it might be a little bit hard to find. Hey, guys. It's Paul. I got a oh, question. Hey. hey. <laughs> so, yeah, great talk. Um, a lot of good information there. I just wanted to ask, like, I mean, it sound and I mean, I've been looking at a bunch of these courses and um, I had signed up for the intro uh, to effects using Houdini, but I backed out of that because I didn't have time. Um, that would have been back in the winter term. Now, this abstract effects in Houdini, I saw this, but I kind of thought it would have been um, too advanced for someone who's just basically getting started. I mean, I'm not completely green, but you know, there's there's a lot I need to learn. So I, I wasn't sure if this would have been a good, you know, uh, starting point, but it sounds like you cover a lot of really interesting uh, tools and concepts that I'm actually struggling with. Well, not struggling with, but it's uh, it's it's a key point that I need to learn right now. Like you were talking about the, uh, all the copy uh, copy sops and and the noise and you know transferring attributes between you know so it, it, I thought you would have started initially more complex so I'm kind of happy to hear that you know it, it sort of starts out I wouldn't say slow but it builds up to an intense yeah of, yeah and um, it's designed that way it's it's designed not for people that are like 100% new cuz there's plenty of material out there for that and if we if we just wanted to focus on people that haven't ever used the program or had very very little experience with the program we'd be spending the first 5 week, 5 weeks yeah. just you know dealing with what the hell is this program right um, so we kind of bypass that but i think once you're if you have a little bit of comfort or comfortability excuse me uh, i'm just butchering that word i'm just going to skip it um, but if you're if you're comfortable with the program, um, then I think this is a, a good class, even if you're not too knowledgeable about all of the areas that are involved. And I try really hard, I think for most of the class to just stay within the SOPS context. Awesome. Uh, just to try to, to not like explode um, people's brains. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think the other thing too is like when you go too advanced with a class, I think the market for that decreases significantly because right. people people that know this stuff generally don't need to be taking classes or the thing that they're interested in is so like minute in terms of what they're going to get out of the class that it's just not beneficial to them. So it's definitely, I, I would call it a, a beginner slash intermediate level. Okay. Um, now, so you... So you deal mostly with with SOPs, yeah, at the start in because I mean, yeah, that is basically the building blocks within within the program, right? Now, mm -hmm. I, it it's awesome. I'm pretty excited about that because one of my friends who w just finished that method, he was telling me that he sh I was <laughs> I was messing around with the. Uh, DOP networks and yeah, trying to do smoke sims and rigid bodies and stuff, and he's like, man. You're never gonna get hired, and and be working with those things right away because he's like sims are expensive. It takes time. He's like learn sops if you're gonna do anything to start, uh, just learn sops. And I was like, okay, okay. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm actually probably gonna take another hard look at this course and 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 actually that's another question for you. I'm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm doing the classic, hey, let's do explosions and all this other stuff. But I mean, you know, I come from a, a hand-drawn animation background, got into motion, like painting and everything. So I, I have a classical uh, art background. And yeah, I mean, some of the things you were touching on earlier sounds like this course would actually be a lot more fun um, to explore than, and, you know, going and taking that other course um not to say that you know i forget who forget who the guy teaches it but he's also at stormborn um, oh yeah manual you talked yeah about, uh, yes. Good too. yes um 
I mean, I, I'd love to take them all, but uh, actually, I'm uh, after listening to you guys talk about this, I'm pretty yeah. excited about it. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that's really much a question, but yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, there's definitely something to get out of it. Um, I had one student before who was a um, already professional Houdini user, and he was coming from worlds of explosions and dynamics and stuff like that. And he really wanted to try doing some abstract stuff and get some experience here. And I think he found the class really eye opening awesome. uh, to just understand that process and get a little bit more experience doing things that are absolutely out of his wheelhouse. Um, and yeah, again, none of this stuff is, is, is done in a way that like, you're going to feel super unhappy and uncomfortable about. Um, I think as, as you know, if you haven't had the experience dealing with abstract stuff, I'm going to, I'm using air quotes here. No one can see that. I'm using air <laughs> quotes. Um, yeah, if you haven't had the experience dealing with abstract stuff, you know, it's pretty freeing to be honest. It can be a little like, I will say that if, if you're you're the the type of person that's really focused on making something that's real and based on reference that you know um it can be scary i think it can be really scary um and and panic inducing <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh i think it's really great to step out of your comfort zone in in uh places and as often as you well i won't say as often as you can but often to step out of your comfort zone and and get some new experiences in um and there's definitely something to learn i think in the class no matter what your interests are you're going to come out of this learning something for sure yeah that's that's sounds great because that's you know having having a vision um can sometimes be i mean we're all creative but you know sometimes it, it's hard it's hard to come up with uh, with an with an idea or or a direction for something. So being able to, you know, train or flex that that mu that creative muscle that allows you to think in a way that's like you said not not um, something that you might see in in nature or you know like an explosion you know for for example, but something more yeah out there uh that that definitely beneficial cool well i hope we see you there yeah, yeah. no this is great guys i really appreciate it no problem well thanks for stopping by <clears throat> i was wondering does anyone else have any i think we have time for maybe one or two more questions um from either paul we got ryan manual um, any questions don't be afraid to ask if there's no more questions though um i think we can start getting ready to wrap up no questions from ryan just trying to hard to take the leap from cinema 40 to Houdini. um adam do you have anything to say about that that's something you did no just keep working i mean just that's, that's yeah it's uh it's I, I don't think it's a hard leap um well no that's not true let me rewind it is a hard leap <laughs> um yeah, it's tricky. It's a totally different methodology of thinking and working. And Cinema 40 has some really easy workflows for some of the things that people like to do in it. So it can be a bit frustrating, I think, at first when you're like, why is this so complicated when <laughs> I have three things that do what I wanted to do in Cinema 40 and here I am stringing nodes together and this and that. Um, so the, yeah. the advice that I would say there is you're sacrificing a little bit of, of ease of use for an immense amount of flexibility and power. So it's just something to think about, you know, um, to understand why it is that you're there in the first place and why it is that you're trying to learn the software. And if you can keep that in mind, then uh, yeah, it will come, this will come in time, I mean. Yeah, that's true. The other thing too, to point to, to talk about that is, um, what's amazing too is that it's really easy to build assets in Houdini. So if there's a setup that you like, and it took you some time to do, you can just turn that into an asset that you can use just like any other node that you call up in Houdini and just keep reusing that over and over again. So for instance, I have my own version of what you would call the Cinema 4D MoGraph tools, all the mm -hmm. fall off objects and cloner stuff and all that other stuff. Oh, so that's right. Yes, yeah, so I don't sit there rebuilding the wheel every time that I need to do it. Um, I just pull up my asset and it works how I want it to work. So. You know, I look at how Cinema 4D did it, and I said, well, 
I like this and I like this, but I don't like this and I want this that it doesn't have. And I just kind of mix and match. It's not not too hard. And that's one thing that I actually do show in the, the um, section on copy properties there is how to do a um, how to do a fall off object. Uh, we just do spherical fall off for that class, but it's pretty easy to abstract that and turn that into all the other different kinds of fall offs that you want to do, as long as you know a little bit of the underlying math, which is not too complicated. Uh, good places to find HDAs besides Orbolt. Orbolt is pretty much the marketplace for HDAs. Um, one of my good buddies, uh, Henry Foster, has just released something with uh, one of the guys from iSponza uh, in Germany um, called Mops, M-O-P-S. Oh, and yeah. They're selling that on their site. And that's kind of like their version of some of these motion tools as well. Uh, and that's worth checking out. I, I gave them a little bit of feedback on that early on, um, but they've done, I mean, 99.9% .9 of the work is stuff that they did uh, in addition with a few other people. But people are, are liking that, but it's it's in active development right now. So I think if you're in cinema and you want to find some easy ways to do some of this kind of stuff, Mop seems to be a pretty good um, free for now uh, way of looking at some of that stuff. Awesome. Thanks for um, answering those questions, Adam. Yeah, Brian's is awesome, too. Um, cool. And then, so I guess that's a good amount of questions, and we'll just sort of wind it down. Um, Adam, it's been great talking to you, and I was wondering for our listeners, where can they follow you online? Like, Where, where are you at online? Where are the listeners, or is that question? That question wasn't for me, was it? Oh, that was for you, Adam. Uh, oh, that was that for me. Where are you oh, online? Oh. Uh, oh, where where can you find me online? Yeah. I, I have a website. Um, it's kind of old, but I'll put it into our chat field. And that, that website really just shows my directing work. It doesn't show all my TD stuff. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let me... I've done a bunch of... Um, TD work for music videos and stuff like that with other directors, but I don't put that on my own personal website. That is the company that I work for, and a huge portion of the work on this website, the Wolf and Crow site, is stuff that I've done. And where else? I'm on Vimeo and I'm on um, social media, I rarely post on. Uh, I can uh, link your Vimeo for everyone too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want to connect connect with me, probably Facebook's the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So um, everyone knows where to find you. Uh, for people that can't see the chat, it's uh, adamswab.com, S-W-A-A-B, and uh, wolfandcrow.com. That's the place you need, which is you do great work, um, which is mostly mm -hmm. work from you. Um, and well, not mostly work. We, we have other creative directors there, too. But yeah, yeah, but... But yeah, there's a there's a big portion that that is uh, I'm 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 well represented on the site. I'll, let's just say that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, once again, Adam, it's it's really been great talking to you. Sort of your ideology about making abstract art, how to work in the environment, what students can do to sort of be the best students that they can be. Um, and then thank you for everyone for tuning in. Um, you can connect with us on Facebook and see Society Meetup. Um, and then you can connect this uh catch this webinar later on on cgs uh, society.org um, all right thanks adam it's really yeah. great thank you this was a pleasure thank you everybody for tuning in